My name is Vicki Linares and I'm the current geriatric fellow at the University of Iowa and today we'll be talking about gait and balance. I have no financial disclosures to discuss. So first off, I'd just kind of like to go through our learning objectives. I would like to review um, screening guidelines for gait and balance disorders, history and physical exam, as well as how to describe and classify gait disorders, and then interventions for gait disorders as well. So why is this important? Why does it matter? Well, the truth is that about 20% of non-institutionalized older adults experience difficulty walking and even require the assistance of either another person or an assistive device. More than a third of community dwelling adults 65 years and older um, actually fall each year. And in adults greater than 85 years old, the prevalence of walking issues can actually reach over 50%. Older adults with gait disorders, particularly neurologically abnormal gaits, are at a higher risk of institutionalization and even death. So gait imbalance. The truth is that it's not really always a walk in the park. It's rather difficult and it takes uh, coordination of many systems. And so it involves the sensory systems, vision, vestibular, and proprioception, as well as the central and peripheral nervous systems, cardiopulmonary system, the musculoskeletal system, and environmental factors as well. So definition of a disordered gait. The truth is there really is no clear definition of what a disordered gait is. And the reason that is is because we don't really have a standard definition of what a normal gait is. Different definitions have been proposed in the past, and this includes the idea of perhaps a slowed gait speed as being the start of an abnormal gait, and also um, deviations in smoothness, symmetry, or even synchrony. A slowed abnormal gait may actually provide the older adult with a safe and functional gait. So although it may not be aesthetically pleasing, it's actually functional and useful for the older adult. So screening guidelines. Evidence suggests that people age 65 and over with a fall should be screened, as well as any of those reporting one injurious fall, two or more non-injurious falls, and any report of unsteady gait or balance. And the truth is our threshold for gait and balance evaluation should be rather low. So if the patient themselves report an issue with unsteady gait or balance, or even a family member or a caregiver notice something, that elder should be evaluated. There are different risk factors and contributors um, to gait issues and balance issues, and some of them stem from the fear of falling, pain, stiffness, numbness, weakness, different neurologic diseases such as normal pressure hydrocephalus, stroke, Parkinson's disease, or Parkinsonism. Um, different musculoskeletal issues, degenerative joint disease, claudication can also pose an issue, and impairments, in, impairments after orthopedic uh, surgeries. Vision loss also plays a role, as does postural hypotension. So in looking at the history and physical exam for gait disorders and balance issues, there are several things that we should consider. So first off, taking a close look at their medical history and reviewing their problem list is going to be important. Um, taking special note of different diseases that may impair their sensory function. So for example, in a diabetic patient, you would worry about a type of peripheral neuropathy um, or something of that sort. In a patient who has more vascular disease, you wonder about claudication um, and things like that. The other thing to consider is taking a close look at their medications and reviewing them in detail. Um, doing the dix Hallpike maneuver is helpful because it can oftentimes uncover any vestibular dysfunction. Uh, orthostatic blood pressure is also very important to take a look at. And so just a reminder about orthostatic blood pressure. So if you have a 20 millimeter in mercury um, systolic drop or a 10 millimeter mercury diastolic drop that would classify as orthostatic hypotension. Um, and once again, you would want to look at their medications and see if anything is affecting that. Uh, vision screening is also very important. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or elaborate. It can literally be just as easy as giving them a newspaper to read and having them read the headline 
and then read um, a few lines within one of the articles. And this could help uncover any uh, issues with central vision. So oftentimes macular degeneration, glaucoma, or cataracts can affect a patient's central vision, and this can lead to gait and balance issues. Sometimes it's as simple as discovering that they got a pair of new bifocal lenses and they just haven't adjusted, and so maybe having them switch back to a single strength lens um, can be helpful and help uh, fix the problem. So checking their neck, spine, and extremities is gonna be very important. You would wanna look for any contractures, which at times can be very subtle and aren't picked up until you're doing range of movement exercises. And then taking a close look at their feet as well. Um, do they have any podiatry issues that could be resolved and could be impairing their gait? So things like ingrown toenails, um, long toenails, uh, also, the, the health, the, the state of their feet is important to look at as well because it gives you an idea of how well they're functioning at home. Um, doing a complete neurologic exam is going to be very important. So taking a look at strength, tone, sensation, proprioception, coordination, cerebellar functioning, and then station and gait as well. And then doing a quick cognitive exam is going to be important. And so studies have shown that um, sometimes gait disorders can foreshadow cognitive issues to come and that the converse is actually true as well. People with already existing cognitive disorders often have issues with gait and balance. So laboratory and imaging. Starting with a basic metabolic panel and CBC, are helpful because it helps you look for any electrolyte abnormalities or any possible anemias that could be contributing to lightheadedness and dizziness. Also ruling out any thyroid disorders is very important, as well as looking at B12 levels to make sure that there's not a peripheral neuropathy that exists. Head and spine imaging generally isn't indicated unless there's another focal neurologic issue or acute concern that is happening. So gait assessment. Um, Gait speed and endurance have often been predictors of falls, disability, hospitalization, institutionalization, and even mortality. There's different tests that you can do to evaluate gait and balance. And one of them is just simply measuring the gait speed. So studies have shown that a gait speed of 0.6 meters per second is usually indicative of disability and poor health outcomes. A more ideal gait speed is 1.0 to 1.2 meters per second. This is a sign of better functional outcomes and increased life expectancy. The other test that's possible is the six minute walk. This test is nice because it's fast, easy to do, doesn't require much equipment, and patients are usually agreeable to it. It's also nice because it evaluates multiple systems. It takes a look at aerobic capacity, endurance, cardiopulmonary system, as well as the musculoskeletal system. The most common test used in the clinical setting is probably the timed up and go test, or TUG. So the TUG test is a time sequence of rising from a chair, walking about three meters, turning, and coming back and sitting in the chair. There's really no set cutoff point, but some studies have shown that taking longer than 14 seconds to do this is correlated with fall risks as well. It's best used as a global assessment of the patient's fall risk. So the nice thing about the tug test is that it identifies deficits in leg strength, balance, vestibular dysfunction, and gait. It is also timed, and the times are compared to different age groups. So from 60 to 69, from 70 to 79, and from 80 to 89, and so forth. So a few other tests that exist for gait assessment are the Berg Balance Test and the Performance Oriented Mobility Assessment, or the POMA for short. The Berg Balance Test strictly looks at balance, and so that's important to keep in mind, that it doesn't actually assess gait. The ability to balance during predetermined tasks is looked at. So for example, um, going from sitting to standing, standing upright unassisted, and so forth. It takes about 20 minutes to do. This test has been commonly used in um, rehabilitation centers and often for patients after a stroke uh, has occurred. The Performance Oriented Mobility Assessment takes a look at balance, step continuity, and path deviation. It assesses both balance and gait. And the 
drawback here is that there's really no reliable cutoff point that has been established, but it is helpful for kind of comparative evaluations. So now we'll discuss different gait abnormalities and descriptions. Um, so first, there's antalgic gait, and that's basically um, pain-induced limp with shortened stance phase of gait on the painful side. There's also festination, which is acceleration of gait, um, foot slap, which is early frequent audible foot to floor contact with steppage of gait compensation, freezing of gait, so sh sudden, short duration, diminution, or even cessation of walking, and this is usually associated with a change in attention, circumstance, or direction. Propulsion is simply the tendency to fall forward, whereas retropulsion is a tendency to fall backward. Steppage is exaggerated hip flexion, knee flexion, and foot lifting, usually accompanied by foot drop. And then there's turn and block. So this is simply when the patient moves their entire body as they're trying to turn, instead of being able to turn on a point as most people are. So circumduction is basically just the outward swing of the leg in a semicircle fashion from the hip. So if you can see or imagine that we're kind of looking at the patient from above, this leg remains pretty still and doesn't bend very much at the knee. And so we kind of have this arc pattern that is um, seen. Equinovarus is simply the excessive plantar flexion and inversion of the ankle. Foot drop is loss of ankle dorsiflexion and is secondary to weakness of the ankle dorsiflexors. So here you can see that there's weakness and so this person is unable to dorsiflex their foot. Um, here they have a brace and so it's somewhat corrected. Genu recurvatum is simply the hyperextension of the knee. So here we have a normal knee and here we have this exaggerated extension here. So scissoring is simply hip abduction such that the knee crosses in front of the other knee with each step. So here you can see it's, they're kind of mid-step and the knee is in, directly in front of the other knee. So Trendelenburg gait is the shift of the trunk over the affected hip which drops because of hip abductor weakness. So here we have a normal gait. The pelvis is well supported and level. And here we have the Trendelenburg gait, and so it's kind of weak and falls to the side. So there's often the kind of this swaying movement of the hips that can be seen, and the trunk will kind of shift over to the affected side to kind of maintain that center of balance. So gait disorders can also be assessed and categorized according to the sensory motor levels that are affected. We'll kind of quickly run through this because I think it also helps um, differentiate different type of gait disorders. There's low, middle, and high. So starting with low. Low is characterized into peripheral sensory dysfunction and peripheral motor dysfunction. And so we'll start first with sensory dysfunction. So in this category, we have things like peripheral neuropathy or proprioceptive deficits. We also have vestibular disorders and visual impairment. Um, so things seen in peripheral neuropathy. There's usually this loss of touch sense and loss of position sense. And so oftentimes you'll see a steppage gait. They can be wide-based and unsteady and oftentimes uncoordinated as well. Vestibular disorders often come with disequilibrium, and so you'll oftentimes see an abnormal Romberg sign. There's weaving and falling to one side or the other. Visual impairment or vision loss is basically a tentative, uncertain, and ultimately uncoordinated gait. So low peripheral motor dysfunction um, can be painful or deforming conditions versus a focal myopathy or a neuropathic weakness that exists. So for the painful deforming conditions, it's often um, arthritis of a hip, knee, it could be of the spine. There's often kyphosis or lordosis and a stoop posture that exists as well. And so with these type of disorders, you'll see an antalgic or a Trendelenburg gait. With the more focal myopathy or neuropathic weakness, you can often have proximal and distal muscle weakness, as well as exaggerated lumbar lordosis due to the pelvic girdle weakness that exists. And so they'll often have a Trendelenburg gait, 
sometimes a waddling gait and steppage as well. The nice thing about the low peripheral motor dysfunction is that these patients usually adapt pretty well and can compensate very well when using assistive devices. So next is the middle sensory motor level. This is more issues with postural and local motor impairment. Um, so first off, we have cerebellar ataxia. Um, these patients often display poor trunk control and coordination and can have other cerebellar signs on their neurologic exam. Oftentimes, their gait abnormalities are described as wide-based with increased trunk sway, irregular stepping, staggering, and difficult with turns. Parkinsonism has the uh, main features of bradykinesia, rigidity, tremor, and stooped posture. Their gait is often, often a shuffling type of gait, so short kind of sweeping type steps. Um, they are prone to festination and so often will accelerate very quickly as they're walking along. Uh, they are also prone to either propulsion or retropulsion, so fall, falling either the tendency to fall forward or the tendency to fall backward. And then they can often be seen turning in block, so kind of keeping their whole body stiff as they're making a turn. They also have absent arm swing and freezing of gait. And then finally, we have hemiplegia um, or paraplegia. And so that's arm and leg weakness or spasticity. Oftentimes, we can see leg circumduction here, loss of arm swing, foot drag, and scrape as well. Next, we have the high sensory motor level. And so this is issues with actual um, cognitive um, dysfunction and white matter disorders. Um, so we have frontal lobe uh, dementia and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Oftentimes you'll see cognitive impairment, weakness, spasticity, and even some urinary incontinence. So their gait um, will usually have some um, difficulty kind of initiating the gait. They'll have freezing, leg apraxia, and shuffling. Uh, it does look similar to a Parkinson's gait, but it's a little more wider based. Um, their posture is also different. They are able to stay a little more upright and they're not as stooped forward as a Parkinson's patient would be. Um, and they have preserved arm swing. Uh, next, we have dementia, both Alzheimer's and vascular. Um, and oftentimes, these patients have a fear of falling. And so you'll see a cautious gait with a normal to widened base or a shortened stride. Um, oftentimes, they'll have decreased speed and they'll turn and block as well. The other kind of important thing to mention here is that depression is actually thought to be uh, correlated to gait disorders. The link doesn't remain very clear, but we, we do know that there is some type of correlation that exists. So overall, it's really important to remember that no gait disorder can be um, classified in, in, into any one of these boxes. They're really actually more multifactorial. And a good example of that would be a long-standing diabetic patient. So this patient has maybe now developed peripheral neuropathy, um, has possibly suffered a stroke, and now has some resulting um, hemiparesis or hemiplegia. So different interventions that we can discuss. The important thing to remember with interventions is that conditions causing gait disorders are sometimes only partially treatable. And so some dysfunction will remain. It is rather unrealistic to consider that the elder can go back to their pre-morbid gait, and so our treatment goal really is functional, functional improvement of their gait. Remembering that comorbidity, disease severity, and overall health status strongly influence their treatment outcome as well. So now we'll discuss some interventions. Overwhelming evidence supports a multifactorial interventional approach. And it shows that risk factor assessment, physical therapy or exercise, medication reduction or discontinuation, and home safety modification tend to show the best outcomes. So physical therapy is very helpful. And so the type of physical therapy for gait and balance would be really focused on progressive standing balance and strength exercises. Um, they would do practice with uh, transfers and different type of gait interventions. Um, sometimes it's even evaluation for an assistive device, uh, be it a cane or a walker, and then um, techniques for rising after a fall, and even some endurance training. Some of the challenges with physical therapy, though, 
um, is that oftentimes exercise needs to be continued to kind of maintain these changes. And that can be difficult in a frail older adult or perhaps an older adult with um, not a lot of social support or encouragement to keep up with their physical therapy exercises. Um, and then finally, the other caveat with physical therapy is that we don't really have enough evidence to prove that it's helpful in patients with dementia. There are different assistive devices that people can use to help with gait and balance. The ones we'll focus on are canes and walkers for now. Um, so the important thing to keep in mind is what are we using the assistive device for. So a cane may be more appropriate in people with mild balance problems or injuries that are um, of just affecting one foot or leg. Walkers are more helpful for patients that have pain on both sides and have more moderate to severe balance and gait issues. A cane can support up to 25% of the patient's weight, whereas a walker can support up to 50% of a patient's weight. Canes come in single point cane variety, four point canes, and seated canes as well. Whereas walkers are the standard walkers, so no wheels, front wheeled walkers, or a rolling, or I'm sorry, a rolling four wheeled walker with or without seats or brakes. Other considerations, um, canes should have non-skid rubber tips. Um, the handles that come on the canes can be changed, so there's curved handles and grip handles, and all of this helps with balance, but it also helps decrease the amount of stress on the patient's hand. Um, canes are not as stable as walkers, but the benefit is that they can be used going upstairs, whereas a walker cannot. Walkers should also have rubber grips for hands to avoid slipping, and then front wheel walkers must have non-skid tips on the back legs as well. Here's uh, some pictures of different walkers, and so here we have kind of our front wheeled walker. Um, we have some of the four point canes versus the single point cane. And up here you can see some of the differences in the handle. So here's the curve handle versus the grip type handle. Um, here we have a four-wheeled walker. Um, it has brakes and a seat that is available for the patient as well as a little basket for helping them carry things. So assistive devices are important, um, but proper fitting of these devices is just as important. And so reminding the patient to wear their normal shoes um, and having them kind of relax their arms at their sides nice and loosely is going to be very important. Essentially, you measure the the um, length between their wrist and the floor, and that ideally should be the height of the cane or the walker that they're using. Then you have them kind of hold on to their cane or their walker, and you look at their bend in their elbow, and the ideal is 20 to 30 degrees of bend in the elbow. So here we have a picture of what a proper fitting cane should look like. So if we see here this gentleman the cane is too short, his arm is fully extended and he's kind of like leaning over the cane. Whereas in this gentleman, the cane is too high, his arm is bent much past 30 degrees, almost to 45 degrees, um, and it's, he's not really getting much support from it. This gentleman here in the middle is just right. So we see the 20 to 30 degree bend at the elbow and we see um, the wrist to the floor length of the cane. The next intervention that can be done is taking a close look at their medications. And so here our goal is to uh, consider a reduction in dosage versus discontinuation of the medication. And of course you would want to eliminate any unnecessary medication. Um, there are certain types of medications that deserve special consideration. And so psychoactive medications, things that are essentially active like antidepressants, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, and even sedatives um, should be looked at or uh, discontinued. Um, any medications that can cause orthostasis, mainly antihypertensives, alpha blockers, and nitrates. Um, any medications that can cause confusion or impaired alertness, such as opiates, antihistamines, and even anticonvulsants can do this. Um, and then finally, any medications that may cause Parkinsonian type uh, symptoms, such as antipsychotics or metroclopramide. Uh, digitalis and digoxin are also mentioned in the literature, but these are often older medications and are not as used um, as commonly anymore. 
So next we have home safety modifications that can be done. Um, there are different adaptive devices that can be used, so reaching devices, um, sock aids, and long shoehorns can be very helpful uh, for the patient so that they don't lose their balance as they're bending over to put their shoes on. Uh, grab bars in the bathtub, shower chairs, and even elevating the toilet seat can help. Um, so here in, in our picture we have a patient who's using a, a sock device. Um, additionally, removing any tripping hazards from the home, so getting rid of any area rugs that may not be well affixed or simply just cause a difference in levels in the floor. Um, likewise, getting rid of any thresholds is going to be really important. Um, ensuring that the home has adequate lighting. Uh, keeping a telephone at the floor level or even having the patient keep their cell phone in their pocket at all times is very helpful. And then considering a personal emergency response system, so something like Life Alert or Lifeline. So next, looking at shoes is going to be very important. Um, so many women will have to give up their high fancy stilettos and instead invest in a pair of good walking shoes. And so something that's well fitted, has low heels, has thin firm soles, um, and has a high fixed collar support. And so if we look at our picture here, we have all of those criteria that are met, and she's even using her assistive device appropriately. So lastly, we have Tai Chi. And Tai Chi is a Chinese martial art that's practiced for both defense training and health benefits as well. It's been shown to reduce the rate of falls and injury-related injury falls over the short term, so less than 12 months or so, by approximately 43% and 50% respectively. It basically improves balance, aerobic capacity, and can strengthen lower extremities as well. Well, thank you for watching. I hope this was helpful, um, and I hope you learned a little bit about gait and balance.